Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everybody. Good evening if you happen to be joining us from the other side of the Pacific. I'm Greg Poling. I direct the Southeast Asia Program and the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative here at CSIS. And this is the first session of our now annual Asian Architecture Conference here at CSIS, which is conducted in cooperation with our econ program and our Shoal Chair in International Business. Because of COVID, as with everything, this one's gotten more complicated. So we're splitting into two events. Uh, today's panel is going to focus on next week's ASEAN summits and related meetings, which will take place on uh, October 26th to 28th. And then next week, you can tune in for part two, run by my econ colleagues, focusing on next month's APEC summit. Uh, today's event is on the record. Everything's being streamed over CSIS and YouTube, and you can catch it later on those platforms. If you want to ask questions when we get to Q&A, because we're doing this as a live stream over the website, you can just type in your questions on, on that form, and I'll be able to see them and read them to our guests. And uh, today's event is being made possible by general support to CSIS. Uh, now, uh, our guest today, our keynote, is going to be Edgard Kagan. Uh, Edgar is the Senior Director for uh, East Asian Oceania at the National Security Council uh, and previously was the DCM in uh, the USMC in India. Previous pros included Mumbai, KL, the Asia team here at State, and pretty much everywhere else in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but Edgar is having a little bit of technical difficulties. So while he gets those sorted out, I'm going to put uh, one of our panelists on the spot to start us off, because I know you've all dealt with a few minutes of dead air already. Uh, actually, hold that. I'm going to let Abe off the hook. I'm Edgar. Hi, I'm so sorry, Greg. I, I This is clearly a major uh, challenge, ex expecting me to be able to do this on my own. Um, and so I apologize profusely to everybody. Um, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, and I'm really grateful to Greg and to our good friends um, and uh, counselors at CSIS for the privilege of being invited today. Um, you know, first, it's great to be on and it's great to see the names of so many people that I've worked with over the years who have helped teach me, um, bring me closer to wisdom, um, though it's still a long way to go, I fear. Um, and to, you know, who've been such good colleagues, um, particularly as we have, I think, really sort of shifted in the past decade very much, our, or I guess more than that, by 12, 13 years, are thinking about uh, Asian regional architecture. Um, I think that, you know, it's worth going back. I mean, I used to work, uh, when I worked in the State Department in the 2000s, um, I used to work for Assistant Secretary Jim Kelly. Uh, and Jim Kelly was a true gentleman, a really honorable person, someone who stood out because he had been Senior Director for Asia at the NSC, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia at DOD, as well as Assistant Secretary of State at EAP. And I would note in those days, there was no Assistant Secretary for, um, the, for Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific. So he really had the trifecta of senior government jobs um, dealing with Asia in the U.S. government. And, you know, one of the things that he used to say when there were discussions about Asian architecture is that the challenge of talking about Asian architecture is it sort of presupposes that there's an architect. Uh, and that one of the things that made architecture in Asia extremely challenging was that there really wasn't, at, certainly in that time, in the early 2000s, um, an, a, a clear sense of who should be the architect or who would be the architect. I think, though, that if we look back with the perspective of today, what is quite remarkable is the degree to which the countries of Southeast Asia and, you know, working both individually and collectively have made themselves the architects of Asian architecture um, or institutional architecture. And, you know, obviously we can disagree. There are many different, um, there are many different, you know, entities. There are many different ways in which you can talk about architecture in Asia. But the reality is that if you look back over the period of the last 20 years, what is quite remarkable, at least to me, is the degree to which ASEAN has managed to, and the, the countries of ASEAN have managed to make themselves really at 
the key players in terms of developing an Asian architecture. Now, there has been cooperation, um, and I think part of this is that there has been sort of, you know, the, the problem of not having an architect meant that to, there was sort of a default to the existing institutions. In many ways, ASEAN was, I think, the most developed and also had the clearest sense of its own role, certainly in the period 20 years ago, 15 years ago, as some of these things were uh, being done. So I think that from our perspective in the Biden-Harris administration, I think that it is very clear that architecture in Asia is a complex question, it's a complex issue. But the reality is that there are institutions and at the very center of it all is obviously ASEAN. Um, and that is testified to by a number of things. One is the very simple fact that the East Asia Summit um, remains the premier body that really brings together all the key players across the Indo-Pacific. Um, APEC obviously continues to be important and has a slightly different mix of players. Um, and there are other bodies as well. But I think that there, there's nothing that really brings together the players in the way the East Asia Summit does. And I think that we recognize that. We also recognize that, you know, the U.S. relationship with ASEAN is absolutely critical to our efforts to strengthen our position in the Indo-Pacific and really try and step up the relationships as we focus our efforts in the area that I think we all accept and agree is going to be the center of geopolitics um, for the you know, foreseeable future. Uh, there's no question that when you look at the combination of you know, economic dynamism, growth, uh, where gr global growth will come from in the next 30 to 50 years, as well as obviously population um, and many other things, and, and innovation, you know, the Indo-Pacific region, and obviously we consider the United States to be part of the Indo-Pacific, is going to be the driver of most of the key factors that shape global power and uh, global prosperity for the foreseeable future. And at the part of that is obviously ASEAN. Uh, and I think that you can see even, you know, we're very proud of the work that has gone into developing the Quad, both in the uh, last administration as well as in this one. Um, we also recognize that, you know, as Americans, we often tend to think the world revolves around us, but we recognize the development of the Quad really reflects tremendous efforts by the other partners. And the Quad, we believe, is very positive in terms of its ability to contribute to the greater good in the Indo-Pacific. But at the same time, if you look very carefully at what the Quad has been saying, and I, I suspect that there's... Uh, much higher percentage of the people on this call have actually read the statements than it would be the case of the general public. Um, I think that it's clear that the Quad is very, very focused on acknowledging and working from the working with the principle of ASEAN centrality. Uh, and I think that that reflects the fact that if you want to be able to be effective in the Indo Pacific, you have to be able to work with ASEAN. And the United States realizes that. We're very aware of the importance of the partnership with ASEAN as an organization, but obviously with the individual members. Um, I think that if you look at what we have been trying to do since the beginning of the, this administration, um, but really I want to acknowledge building off some of the efforts that were done in the previous administration, um, and I think this is an area where there continues to be a great deal of bipartisanship in terms of a shared consensus on the importance of the Indo-Pacific region, on the importance of the partnerships and the alliances that we have, on the importance of the economic ties. But if, if you look at these things, you can see that we have been very focused on the importance of stepping up our game and increasing our, improving our relationships across the board. But we have paid particular attention to Southeast Asia because we recognize the importance of the region uh, to the future of the Indo-Pacific's economic prosperity, as well as to the importance of maintaining uh, security, both traditional and non-traditional, as well as many other areas. I and mean, if you look at issues like climate change, if you look at issues like COVID, which have been, of course, are extraordinarily important right now, I think it's very clear that we're going to need to be able to work with Southeast Asia. And I think that from an American perspective, what is very evident, certainly to me, and I think to those with whom I work um, at, the, uh, at the White House and then in the administration, we understand that 
we, there is a relationship between our ability to work with ASEAN and our ability to improve our bilateral partnerships. I think that one of the decisions that was made that led to, to really stepping up in, in our broader relationship with ASEAN as an institution, as well as joining East Asia Summit, is a recognition that there was a constraint or a ceiling, if you will, on our ability to improve ties with individual countries in Southeast Asia if we were not fully engaged and working closely with ASEAN. And at the same time, working with ASEAN both opens doors in terms of our ability to improve bilateral relationships, but it also opens doors to working uh, collectively to address some of the region's challenges. And I think that you know, from our standpoint, doing that is critical and, you know, this is not to say that it's easy. I think it's also important to recognize that ASEAN itself continues to evolve. Um, and, you know, the idea that there is sort of one ASEAN model is, I think, qu can be questioned. And we've just seen evidence of that with the decision that's been made with regard to uh, Myanmar's representation at the upcoming ASEAN summit. Um, I think this reflects a very significant step. We applaud ASEAN for the leadership that it has shown, both in terms of convening a summit in uh, April and the five-point consensus, um, as well as the decision now. Obviously, we believe that this is not enough and that addressing the challenges that are posed by the coup in Myanmar, as well as the um, you know, extraordinary difficulties that the people of Myanmar are facing as a result of the coup and, you know, I think a combination of extremely difficult challenges, those things require a broader and I think more effective effort. But at the same time, it is important to acknowledge that this is a significant step for ASEAN, one that we applaud, and it reflects the institution, the organization's evolution um, as, it be, as it deals with extremely difficult challenges. You know, so for us, as we look to this ASEAN summit, um, we have a number of priorities that we're looking at. And I think that you can see if you look closely, and, and I suspect, again, there's some people on this, um, on this call who, who probably have, if you look closely at the series of documents that have been produced by this administration, um, ranging from joint statements to uh, communiques at the G7 to the Quad, I mean, you can see a consistent theme which is a recognition of the tremendous importance, first and foremost, of addressing the COVID-19 challenge, of working closely with partners um, bilaterally, multilaterally, through COVAX, uh, because I think that what we all understand is that COVID is not something that can be dealt with only within one's own borders. That as long as there are COVID problems uh, and a COVID uh, pandemic anywhere, none of us are really safe. And so we have really stepped up our efforts working both um, bilaterally, multilaterally with COVAX in terms of providing uh, vaccines, um, but also providing a lot of other assistance to strengthen health systems, deal with immediate crises, but you know, look also to the, you know, the, the reality that we're almost certainly at some point in our lifetimes going to see another pandemic. And very clearly the world was not prepared for this one and we need to step that up. It also offers, I think, an opportunity to work with countries throughout the Indo-Pacific region and around the world on issues that really matter to them. I think that one thing, I don't think any country has come out of this thinking, well, you know, we're doing enough on public health um, or we've got everything under control uh, in terms of our ability to respond to a pandemic. And very clearly, all of us have the need to step up our game to look for ways in which we can invest in capabilities to address what has clearly been an extraordinary challenge and one that we still have not yet fully really gotten a handle on. So I think this is an area where we see tremendous potential to work more with ASEAN. I think that we also believe that there are areas um, in terms of uh, dealing, strengthening the, uh, our ability to address common challenges um, in things having to do with uh, maritime issues, with the ability to look at how we can uh, strengthen our ability to conduct trade using through the strengthening the ASEAN single window and our connectivity with it. I mean, we recognize these are things where we have a strong interest in working closely with ASEAN. 
um, and where there is real benefits that come to us as well as to ASEAN. We also recognize that the countries of ASEAN are very eager to see a you know, greater U.S. economic engagement in the region. And obviously, this is something that is particularly challenging because of the disruptions caused by COVID. I think it is clear, and this is something that we have you know, we've seen us talk about, including in the vice president's uh, remarks in her speech when she was in uh, Southeast Asia in August, that one of the things that has really been driven home is the importance of our supply chains and the importance of resilient supply chains and the fact that, you know, if there were any doubts about U.S. interconnectedness with ASEAN countries um, and countries in Southeast Asia, you can see by the impact that closures of plants um, in Southeast Asia have had on manufacturing in the United States. <clears throat> and so I think that what we've seen is the importance of working on supply chain resiliency um, and recognizing that there, there is not a model in which one can, you know, reshore and become completely independent. Um, and, you know, this is this kind of idea of, you know, supply chain uh, resiliency really means reshoring. I think we recognize this isn't possible. So we have a strong interest in working with countries in Southeast Asia, as we do in other parts of the world, to make sure that our supply chains are strong and resilient, and that we are able to make sure we're able to also have some diversity, so that we're not overly dependent on any one place. Um, so I think that the, the other there are other areas. I don't want to bore people with sort of a, the kinds of things, you know, all the details of what we're going to do, but we see the upcoming engagements with ASEAN and East Asia Summit is something that offers tremendous potential for us to really fill out and, and demonstrate our vision for how to work with the region um, and our commitment to doing so. I think the last thing I would do just to you know, is two things, which are, again, are I think are relevant to a discussion on architecture. One is obviously the quad. Um, I think that there's been a lot of discussion of the quad and I think that it is, clear that, um, you know, the, the quad has really captured people's attention. I think it's worth highlighting our vision for the quad, which is, again, that this is a grouping of like-minded countries who share a commitment and a willingness to take action to support key priorities in the region. I think, you know, people, some people on this call have heard me say in the past that, you know, the, we do not see the quad as an Asian NATO. Um, the Quad doesn't have an institutional structure. There's no stationary. There's no letterhead. Um, this is a, a, a body that of countries getting together to try and solve specific problems, address specific challenges. Um, we're proud of the work that's been done so far, uh, but you know, we recognize that the, the key is demonstrating our ability to follow through. In that regard, we fully appreciate the importance of following through on the Quad Vaccine Initiative, which I think as everybody knows, um, you know, we the Quad committed in uh, March to expanding vaccine production capacity in India um, for distribution uh, in part to Southeast Asia as well as to other countries. Um, and, you know, that was, I think we have to be honest, and I think we've said this before, that was disrupted by the COVID, um, the Delta wave that hit India. Um, but actually, we've made significant progress, and you've seen the first India agreed to the export of the first eight million doses um, in October, and we expect to see that ramp up. Production has increased, and we think that we will start to see fairly significant flows of vaccines uh, from that project. We recognize that is really critical to the Quad's credibility. I think we also see the other areas in which the Quad is working together. It's things that show. A, a, an acknowledgement and appreciation of the challenges facing the region. Uh, and the Quad, you know, I think at this point, really the, the key for us is demonstrating that we're able to follow through on what we've said. And at the same time, looking for ways in which we can expand cooperation on issues that really matter in very tangible terms to the region. The other thing I'd mention is AUKUS. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about AUKUS. Um, and I think that, you know, the views on it have tended to have varied, but I think that in general, there's an appreciation of the significance of AUKUS as a uh, step uh, in terms of acknowledging the challenges we face going forward, but also in strengthening of ties amongst three like-minded partners 
who already work very closely. And, and you know, essentially the U.S., we have extraordinarily close alliances with both Australia and with the U.K. And to some degree, this is about finding ways to work together in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, because we've already we have a long history of working together in many other parts of the world. I would note, however, that you know this is very much about dealing with specific challenges and issues, but in, in a way that, in our view at least, does not fundamentally undermine or challenge or compete with any existing body. This is about strengthening already close coordination and really, to some degree, trilateralizing it as, as we deal with Indo-Pacific issues. Um, so, you know, I think, and, and the other thing is, I can't stress enough the importance that we place on fully respecting global nonproliferation norms. Uh, I think that, you know, it is very clear that for us, as we were looking at this, Australia is extraordinarily uh, high standing on global nonproliferation, played a critical role. It is, you know, not, probably not necessary for this group to repeat, but I, I will anyway. This is about nuclear propulsion, which obviously is, has very specific treatment under the Nonproliferation Treaty um, and is extremely different and has no connection to uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and we believe that this is something that can, can and will be done um, in full uh, adherence to global nonproliferation norms. And in fact, we look forward to setting the highest possible standards uh, going forward. So with that, let me just conclude by saying thank you to our friends at CSIS um, and for organizing this. I think it is extremely valuable and extremely useful. I've learned a lot from these conferences in the past, and I definitely look forward to learning more today. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. That's that's very, very kind. Can we keep you until 9.35 to, to get in a question or two? Absolutely. All right. All right. Let's... um. Uh, as a reminder, folks, if you have a question for Edgar, uh, today we're using the, the live stream on CSIS.org, so go ahead and type it in uh, to, to the screen there, and I'll see it on the back end and get to ask it. In the meantime, Edgar, can I um, ask you for maybe a little more elaboration on the quad-related message that the administration is going to carry to the summit? Um, I mean, I, I think there's going to be a lot of folks on the vaccine pledge, as you said, but we've got the four other working groups from the quad, uh, where do you see the most valuable kind of positive sum message uh, for the administration to deliver? Look, I think that the single most important message is one that all four of the quad members have delivered, um, you know, directly, that has been very clearly articulated in the joint statements. Um, and which we believe is absolutely central, which is the all four members of the Quad fully respect, acknowledge, and value ASEAN centrality. Uh, the Quad does not compete with ASEAN. It is not designed to do so. It is designed to bring to bear the capabilities of four like-minded partners who do share an interest in many issues in the Indo-Pacific. That's not to say that we agree on everything, uh, and but it's also very clear we are not trying to replicate the institutions that ASEAN has developed. We're not trying to compete with them. We want to work with them and we want to find ways in which the Quad as a, as a grouping can work with ASEAN as well as the fact that all four members have long histories of working very closely with ASEAN as an organization as well as with the member states. So I think that's the single overarching message. In terms of what the working groups are doing, I think that you know, this remains a work in progress. I mean, look, right now, I think the vaccine uh, experts working group is clearly the one that's gotten the most attention to some degree. I think the critical and emerging technologies obviously is extremely important. And I think that that's something that reflects a recognition by all four of the quad partners of how important this area is going forward. But I think that it's also worth noting that there are other areas in which the Quad was already working together. I and mean, one thing that's worth keeping in mind is that the decision that the Biden-Harris administration made was essentially to raise the Quad to the summit level. Um, but the Quad already had a wide range of working groups and work streams um, at essentially in its previous incarnation um, at the four minute when it was the, the sort of highest level meeting was the foreign ministers. And so there's a great deal of work that is being done. I think our view is that in most of these areas, this is not exclusive. I and mean, this is not something where it's only going to be four quad countries to working without 
to any outreach to other countries. Almost all these areas are things where there are other countries that have strong interests, that have capabilities, and in some cases of great need. So I think that you know, going forward, the goal is going to be to find ways in which the quad countries can leverage their respective skills and capabilities um, and their willingness to bring capacity to bear in ways that partner with countries in the region, both in uh, by, you know, as individual countries and then through groupings. And I think the quad countries, certainly there's been discussion in which the quad partners all welcome and look for ways in which they would be able to work with ASEAN. So I think that that will be an important message. I think that the other message is that the region has many needs and faces some great challenges. Um, they, they, I think it's very clear, no one has broken the code on what is the best way to address this. Um, you know, I, on things ranging from infrastructure to dealing with climate change, to dealing with COVID, you know, people are still working to figure out what is the best way to do this because there's so many different interests and also the situations have evolved so quickly that it is very clear that the, the, the structures that existed, which in many cases we have to acknowledge weren't fully adequate, have been extraordinarily stressed. So as we deal with climate, for instance, we see this as a tremendous area of opportunity for the entire region. It's also a tremendous area of challenge. I mean, the fact is that the Indo-Pacific region, you know, depending on whose data you look at, is arguably the most challenged region, or certainly, if not the most, one of the most challenged regions by, by climate change. There are countries for whom this is absolutely existential. Um, but at the same time, there are real opportunities, particularly on energy, particularly on ways to, um, to de- uh, uh, de decarbonize um, energy uh, production. And this, these are things that have the ability to create both more stable and secure uh, sources of energy, and at the same time, create real economic opportunity for a region that is going to have to continue to develop significant energy uh, capacity because of the growth and because of its population uh, growth, as well as economic growth that is projected to have. So from our standpoint, this is something that the quad can help play a role on, um, is how do you fully leverage the ability to bring financing as well as ideas to bear on how countries can expand their production of clean energy in ways that also create real economic opportunity for, uh, for citizens in the countries across the Indo-Pacific. So those are things that I think we will be trying to bring. Um, you know, it's also hard. I mean, the reality is that we're looking at a, a, a very interesting sequence. I mean, essentially, there's going to be the ASEAN summit, which, as you all know, will be virtual. There will then be the G20 and there will be COP26. I mean, these are extraordinarily consequential meetings, um, particularly leading into COP26, which, as you know, we believe is an extremely important uh, opportunity to really try and change the trajectory that the world is on with regard to climate change. So I think that for us, we see EAS and we see the U.S. ASEAN Summit as a you know key element of that as we're leading to COP26. But obviously, it's not just going to be about climate, and there are many other issues to be put on the table. Thank you, Edgar. So we have five questions. None of them are about ASEAN. <laughs> we're running short of time. So I'm just going to round up the first two and, and leave it to you uh, how much you want to devote to each one. So uh, first we have John Goyer at the U.S. Chamber who asked, what are U.S. goals and objectives going to be at the APEX Summit next month? And, and will the president participate? Which is a little preview of next week's uh, part two session uh, here at CSIS. And then uh, Karen Lee, formerly with my program here at CSIS, said, uh, Councillor Derek Chalet is currently in the region and plans to discuss Myanmar with U.S. partners. What, in your view, would be positive outcomes of that trip? So look, on the first one, I think that, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my remarks, I mean, we see APEC as continuing to play a very important role um, in the region. And I think that I will note that we've offered to host in 2023. Um, which is, I think, a reflection of both our recognition of its importance, but also our recognition of the continuing potential that APAC has. Uh, we applaud what New Zealand has done and what I think we all have to acknowledge is a tough year. I mean, the reality is that the you know, one of the real powerful things about APAC as it was created was bringing together 
in a whole series of meetings, key players. Um, and I think that there was a period where it was absolutely essential. Um, I think now the reality is that development of the EAS has, to some degree, reduced the, you know, the centrality of APAC in terms of being a platform for people to meet. But it's still extremely important, and New Zealand has done a good job. The truth is, though, doing it virtually clearly reduces some of the impact. I think that New Zealand has done an outstanding job facing that constraint. Um, and so we applaud the work that they've done. I think that for us, what we see is, you know, frankly, at this point, it's primarily about reinforcing our commitment to the regional economic architecture um, and our recognition of the value of the APEC agenda in terms of trying to improve trade flows, improve the ability, improve connectivity, improve the ability, uh, you know, dealing with behind the border issues. Those are things that are really important. And I think it's worth noting, global supply chains are under tremendous stress. I mean, the reality is that, you know, COVID continues to work its way through. And what that really does highlight is a lot of things that are in the traditional APEC agenda, including, you know, trade facilitation, customs behind the border are actually really important. Also ports. Um, I mean, you know, port capacity continues to be a challenge in many places. There's, you know, mismatches. Where are their containers? Where is their need for containers? All sorts of things. And those are things that, in our view, are part of the traditional APEC agenda. And so, you know, we believe that it reinforces the continuing value of APEC. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Derek Chile's trip, I think that, look, you know, part of what he is doing is listening. Part of what he is doing is recognizing that there has there have been shifts in the region in terms of responding to the challenge of Myanmar. Um, and I think, you know, again, what we just saw is extraordinarily significant, at least in my view. Um, and so, you know, I would not I don't want to mislead anyone and think that we were smart enough that we knew that that was coming when we planned Derek's trip. And the truth is we planned this trip. But it, the timing turns out to be extremely fortuitous because it is clear that there is growing frustration in the region with the situation in Myanmar and also growing concern. I mean, the reality is that the quality of governance in Myanmar has dropped precipitously, that the people of Myanmar are facing extraordinary challenges and that the, you know, the, the need to address that is going to require cooperation between countries in ASEAN as well as partners outside. So I think we are going to listen. We're going to you know, make clear our views, which I don't think is a real surprise about how strongly we feel about the importance of return to democracy. But the fact is that, you know, it is very clear that this is not a situation that's going to get better on its own. And so what I think Derek will be doing is making clear our willingness to work with ASEAN partners, also our recognition and appreciation for ASEAN's role in dealing with this. And so, you know, we're grateful to him. I'm personally grateful to him for doing this. It's not an easy trip, I would note, um, as anyone who's traveled in the region right now knows. I mean, the challenges of, you know, limited flights, COVID, um, you know, God knows how many tests they are taking in a relatively short period of time. This is not an easy thing to do, but we think it's important and it reflects our commitment to working with the region. Thank you, Edgar. Well, let me... Uh, let you get out of here. I appreciate you putting up. I can it. listen. I was late. I can take a couple more questions, uh, Greg, and then I'll I'll go. Um, All right. Give me. I'll, I can probably stay for another five minutes. I appreciate. It. Well, uh, I think all three of the remaining questions are on a similar topic. So let me pick one, and and you can expound on it uh, as as you see fit. So Joseph Rota with Ohio University says, given how Mr. Kagan describes the importance of the quad. Why wasn't France included? Um, why have the vested interests and capabilities of France and Pacific been ignored? Uh, and then he goes on to talk about AUKUS. I think the general point being, what's the plan for France uh, in, in our emerging approach to the region? Look, obviously, I think that uh, the French reaction to AUKUS is something that has gotten a tremendous amount of attention. Um, I will leave it to others to speculate, you know, on what exactly is, you know, it means. But I do think that for us, what it does reflect is that France clearly is interested in finding ways to work with us 
um, in the Indo-Pacific. We're willing, we're delighted to do that. I personally have been working and we've done outreach to France going back many years to find ways in which we can improve our coordination in the region. And we fully recognize France's important role um, as well as longstanding commitment. I think in terms of the Quad, um, I, I would just point out that, you know, the genesis of the Quad really is the response to the tsunami in 2004. Uh, where, you know, suddenly four countries that whose navies actually had relatively good relationships found themselves working together, providing uh, humanitarian assistance and relief after that devastating tsunami. Uh, and so, you know, that led to a recognition that actually, you know, we have a lot in common. And there was the first efforts driven by uh, then Prime Minister Abe in his first time around to bring the four together. Um, and then, you know, it sort of broke down for reasons that I think we all know. Um, and uh, there, then was resuscitated again by Prime Minister Abe to a large degree um, starting in 2017. Or, I mean, I think he started talking about in 2016, but we started to see the first steps in 2017. I think that the, you know, the quad has evolved organically because these are four countries that already have a combination of experience working together, capability and capacity, interest. Um, and so I think that there was never a conscious decision to say these are the four countries. You know, again, it goes back to Jim, what, what I said about Jim Kelly's point, that when you talk about Asian architecture and presupposing an architect, which, frankly, there hasn't really been, it's the same with the Quad. I mean, it wasn't that there was a grand strategic vision. This built on, I think, the in a kind of iterative way on what was already being done, but also a set of very shared interests. I would say that. You know, one thing that's been interesting for us in terms of the response to AUKUS is very clearly the fact that there is such widespread interest in Europe in a security-focused partnership in the Indo-Pacific is a very significant development. I think it reflects a recognition in Europe about the importance of some of the security challenges and addressing those security challenges. I think that we look forward to working with France and finding ways in which we can expand our cooperation, um, but really to, to work together on a conceptual level about how we can best bring both you know, French capacity, but more broadly European interest and capacity to bear to help preserve stability um, in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, again, you've been very generous with your time as always, especially embarking on what I'm sure is going to be a very busy couple of months for you and, and the Indo-Pacific team. Uh, so thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, Greg, and thanks to all the colleagues. You've got a great panel, um, and I particularly want to welcome Alina, who I remember very well and when I served in Malaysia. It was one of the people who really gave me extraordinarily good advice about thinking about um, ASEAN, and so it's great to see you, Alina, and I look forward to hearing more about what you guys are discussing. And, you know, one thing about this job is people are not really shy to share advice, um, but we all, and, and I will note that it is, you know, people tend to be more about, you know, listing the things that we haven't done right than the things that we have. But we very much value the partnership and the advice and the guidance that we've gotten from our friends and colleagues outside of government. Um, and, you know, this, it, it's impo extraordinarily important for us to participate, to listen, because we do need to make sure that we're getting the best possible guidance and coming up with the best possible ideas as we deal with truly monumental policy challenges that are going to be incredibly important, certainly for the United States, but I would argue for the region and for the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Edgar. All right, let's now welcome our uh, expert panel. Alina's already gotten a pseudo introduction, but first we're gonna turn to, to Abe Denmark. Uh, so Abe is the newly minted Vice President of Programs and Director of Studies at the Wilson Center. He's also still a senior advisor with the Asia program over there and a senior fellow uh, with the uh, Kissinger Institute for US and China, China and the US, I might've gotten that backwards. Uh, Abe, floor is yours. Thanks, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks Greg. and. Uh, Thank you to CSIS for uh, hosting me. Um, I'm, uh, it's always intimidating to come after Edgar Kagan. Um, he's done such a great job in the White House. I can't tell if he's still on the line. Um, so we can, uh, now that he's gone, we can uh, start talking about him. But 
Um, I think he's done a great job in his in his post as he did in his previous posts, and I'm really glad he's where he is right now at a very critical time. Uh, just that as a caveat in the beginning, these are my views alone, not those of the Wilson Center or of the U.S. government. Um, when I was first putting together my thoughts on uh, Asian architecture, it rem my first thought was uh, to think of um, when uh, a, a reporter asked Mahatma Gandhi his thoughts on Western civilization, he replied, I think it would be a good idea. Um, and that was my thoughts about Asian architecture. It sounds like a good idea. Um, but you know, when you really think about it, there's multiple architectures in, in the region, a complex mix of organizations with different memberships, different missions, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. So if there is an architect, as, as Edgar was talking about, he's, the architect is certainly a modernist. Um, and I think this has led to, for the United States, for other uh, players in, in the Indo-Pacific, a degree of uh, what um, Tanvi Mandan over at Brookings calls uh, flexible multilateralism, um, in which the United States and others engage each mechanism based on a specific issue and, and what they believe was the ideal mix of membership and mission to achieve that, that um, mission on that specific issue. Um, but I think what we've seen in the Biden administration has been a clear effort to expand the strategic architecture of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we've seen that with the Quad, with AUKUS, but, less, uh, uh, it, but in an effort that has received less attention uh, efforts to reinvigorate the U.S.-Japan ROK trilateral. Um, and to me, that's a reflection of both the Indo-Pacific's strategic significance, but also recognition from the U.S. government that uh, the region needs a more robust architecture and that we want to try to build it up to make it more effective um, uh, uh, in, in terms of um, providing public goods, but also um, addressing some of the challenges and issues that the United States is, is confronting. Um, and I think you can see this change by how U.S. government officials are engaging with uh, some of these regional ar uh, architectures and regional mechanisms. And in the past, and I've been part of this, um, it would be difficult to convince senior U.S. government officials uh, to participate in these meetings. It's a very long trip to Southeast Asia, so it's a major time commitment. And there's always going to be few, if any, deliverables. Um, so in the past, it's, it could be difficult to walk into a, a senior official's office and say, hey, boss, you need to spend three days going to Southeast Asia. And when they ask you what we're going to get out of it, you say, nothing. We're, we're just going to talk. That's a tough, tough thing. Um, I was lucky in that Secretary Carter uh, understood ASEAN's uh, importance very deeply and was enthusiastic about engaging in ADMM+. Plus. Um, but um, I think we've seen, just as Edgar has mentioned it before, we're no longer having those conversations. Uh, senior government officials, regardless of, uh, regardless of administration, I think in, in recent years, um, understand these, uh, the significance of these mechanisms and the significance of these institutions um, and are engaging with them in a, in a much more uh, regular and sustained way. Um, and we're seeing, you know, the quad, I think, is clearly seen as a mechanism to deliver public goods to the region, be it climate, infrastructure, vaccines, as Edgar talked about. Um, but it has raised questions, and clearly Edgar was addressing some of those questions about what does this mean for ASEAN? Uh, what does it mean for those related mechanisms like ADMM Plus or EAS? Um, and I think when we talk about ASEAN, when I've talked about ASEAN um, in Washington, there's a palpable degree of frustration. Um, and that frustration was there before uh, the coup in Myanmar, the most recent coup in Myanmar, but it's certainly been intensified since then. Um, frustration that um, ASEAN is not an effective mechanism for change in the region. Um, and I actually, I disagree with that formulation, both in that I think that ASEAN is and can be an effective mechanism for some degree of action, but it's also an important forum, uh, an important forum for uh, the United States to engage in Southeast Asia, but also a form of competition uh, between the United States and China. Um, this, the region, Southeast Asia, is very important to the broader Indo-Pacific, to the United States, to the rest of the global economy, uh, both economically and politically. Um, and um, China has clearly sought to engage 
in ASEAN, both to diminish its effectiveness, but also to spread its influence. Um, and more, more importantly, from an American perspective, ASEAN is important to Southeast Asian countries. But if we want to buttress our relations with those countries, if we want to enhance our engagement with them, we need to be in the fora that is important to them, uh, including ASEAN. Um, and that if we're not engaging in ASEAN robustly, if we're not thinking about how ASEAN fits within our broader architecture, within our broader strategy, uh, we risk diminishing our own influence and ceding uh, some political uh, ground to the Chinese. Um, so a few thoughts on what the United States could do um, in addition to what's already happened in terms of uh, regional architecture in the Indo-Pacific. I think first and foremost, I know this is not the focus of uh, today's discussion, um, but the economic architecture I think is vitally important. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but it has strategic significance in addition to the economic significance. Um, the mechanism, we need to figure out how mechanisms like the Quad and Quad and um, other like-minded states beyond the Quad um, in Europe and in, in other places of Asia, how those mechanisms can cooperate, can engage within ASEAN. Uh, we know that the UK has applied to be a, uh, to uh, get more involved in ASEAN. Um, and as more like-minded states engage more in these regional architectures, we need to use these uh, other mechanisms like the Quad to coordinate and collaborate in how we engage and work in uh, places like ASEAN. Uh, but more than that, um, I think we the Quad is has been a terrific asset, has been a terrific mechanism for the United States, um, but we need to be careful to not let it become the focus of American efforts on architecture. We need to let the Quad be the Quad, uh, let it do what it's good at, but also preserve space for other mechanisms that may be more effective in other areas, like the U.S.-Japan-Australia trilat, the U.S.-Japan-Korea trilat, um, which has, I think, other strengths that the Quad does not. Um, and that brings me to another piece that we need to think about, um, is what's missing from the regional architecture. Uh, one piece that I think is very important and that's been missing from a lot of these discussions has been the ROK. Uh, obviously not a member of the Quad. Um, and um, I worry that um, the ROK is increasingly being left out of some of these discussions. So Seoul, I think, has a lot of work to do on um, how it's going to orient towards region, the regional architecture, but I think Washington has some work to do as well to help the ROK, to encourage the ROK to play a more significant role than I think the role that it should play in Indo-Pacific architectures. Um, the other missing piece to me is Taiwan, um, especially in the economic realm, but also uh, uh, Taiwan ha could have and should have a very important role to play in issues like global health, climate change, regional security, technology, supply chains, and the defense of democracies from uh, Chinese interference and uh, disinformation. Um, so we need to find a way to include them as well, either uh, officially and unofficially in, in these discussions. Um, and the last piece that's been missing, I think, um, in a regional sense, has been a multilateral discussion um, amongst U.S. allies, especially with Japan, Korea, Australia, on nuclear deterrence and reassurance. Uh, there was discussion during the most recent presidential campaign that the Biden administration may adopt a, a sole purpose approach to uh, the role of nuclear weapons, which uh, raises concerns among some of our allies. I think now that the reports, we have these reports that the Chinese have tested a ballistic missile and a hypersonic vehicle in a new and uh, concerning way, I think raises uh, the intensity that uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear dynamics are playing in the region. And we need to engage with our allies, especially in the region, uh, in a much more significant way, not just in bilateral dialogues, but in large, in high level multilateral mechanisms to discuss how to maintain deterrence, both at the conventional and the nuclear level, um, and how we can work together to, um, to reassure one another um, about our ability to maintain deterrence and our ability to, uh, uh, and the ability of the United States to maintain its extended deterrence commitments. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Abe, I appreciate it. Uh, strong start. Uh, so now we're gonna turn to Alina. Uh, Alina Noor is the Director for Political Security Affairs and Deputy Director of the Washington, D.C. Office of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, she was also previously uh, an instructor at APCSS and, as Edgar said, along the Deputy Director of the Institute for Strategic and International Studies in Kuala Lumpur. Alina? 
Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me on this panel. Um, I, as we were talking before this broadcast, Greg, I have very vivid memories of uh, coffee chats with Edgar when he was in Malaysia, and um, I'm heartened that he still remembers some of those conversations. I'm also heartened by the nuance um, throughout this conversation about the role of ASEAN and Asian architecture. It's, uh, I find it rare in this town in Washington, D.C., where ASEAN is um, usually given a lot of short shrift and heavily criticized. And speaking of Asian architecture, I mean, when I was in the region in Southeast Asia, this was a constant point of angst and a lot of hand wringing from among the uh, Southeast Asian states and uh, people as well, because um, the analogy that's often brought up in the region is, well, uh, who's the bus driver, you know, if ASEAN is the bus, the vehicle for a lot of regional cooperation. And I was struck by this design architecture analogy that has cropped up in this discussion. Um, and listening to Abe, I was reminded of uh, the brutalist uh, style of architecture where, you know, ASEAN might be considered ugly sometimes because of how um, rigid and inflexible it is. But if you think of it as a modular complex, um, the word complex has been used a few times now, but in a different sense, of course, where you have many laterals like the quad and, and orcas and all of these different trilats that Abe was talking about kind of built around the compound of ASEAN as a central building, then I think you can see some sort of maybe um, not so pretty architecture taking place in the region, but it also has concerns about what that means for the central building, i.e. ASEAN. I'm going to disband the analogy right now because I'll probably get a little too caught up in it myself. Um, it wouldn't make any sense any longer, but I think two points um, that I'd like to raise. One, the region has been heartened by the support and encouragement um, of ASEAN for ASEAN by the Biden-Harris administration. And this marks a really significant departure from the previous administration's rhetoric um, on ASEAN, where the region was seen as kind of this ballast to be cultivated against China. And that's the other thing that um, I think has been appreciated in the region, this lack of emphasis on competition with China um, when the administration communicates with the region. That's not to say that message is not there when it's communicating with other parts of the world. And of course, the region is very aware of this. But in messaging to the region and its communication to the region, the Biden-Harris administration has very markedly, I think, and, and deliberately left out all these overt references to competition with China. And there is significant alignment um, of priorities between the US and Southeast Asia on public health, uh, as well as other issues like economic engagement and climate change that Edgar talked about. And I think if we step back right now, going into the ASEAN summits next week, obviously public health and uh, economic recovery are going to be huge priorities for Southeast Asian countries. Um, you know, we're in a very privileged position right now where a number of us have already or are going to get our booster shots. But in many parts of the region, um, there are a lot of people who remain unvaccinated, um, some of them because they choose not to get vaccinated, of course, but also because there just hasn't been um, the, a sufficient number of vaccines to go around. And so many Southeast Asian countries, as you know, are, are still not out of the woods yet when it comes to pandemic recovery. And the next step, of course, is to ensure job safety, employment. Um, and as much as people here want to get their new gadgets, phones, tablets, computers in time for Christmas, um, there is also an equal amount of enthusiasm, I feel, in the region to supply those basic chips and assemble those chips that make those high-tech gadgets um, ready for Christmas time. So there is a lot of convergence on priorities between Southeast Asia and um, the United States going into next week's symmetry. I think, that, as I mentioned, there's also a lot of um, encouragement about this emphasis on ASEAN centrality. But, and this is my second point, I think there are still questions about what this really means in practice. 
because you have all these other mini lats um, that purportedly prop up ASEAN centrality, that are meant to help ASEAN centrality. But it, it's unclear what the long-term trajectory is. Um, and there seems to be a bit of dissonance between rhetoric and reality. And I think you see this most clearly in the emphasis on a values-based foreign policy in the Biden-Harris administration. Um, as Southeast Asia watchers will know, the region is fairly agnostic to political ideology and preaching of that ideology. But peppered throughout the national security strategy and many of the statements that have been released by officials in the administration, you'll see this emphasis on democracy and like-mindedness, which has also come up. And I'm not sure how that will play out in the long term in reality um, in the region. And the one thing that strikes me about this idea of like-mindedness and a values-driven foreign policy is um, how one that will play with this humility, um, this policy of humility that's supposed to underpin the Biden-Harris um, administration's foreign policy, um, being very aware that the U.S. also has its own problems, um, but also what this emphasis on democracy will mean for engagement with, say, for example, uh, the next ASEAN chair, Cambodia. This idea of supporting ASEAN centrality also hasn't really borne out in um, engagement, in actual engagement from the administration towards the region. So you've had multiple visits from the cabinet officials to Singapore and Vietnam. There hasn't been a visit to Brunei. There hasn't been a visit to Cambodia, which is the incoming ASEAN chair. And so I wonder um, what this will all mean, especially in the next coming ASEAN chairmanship, uh, but as well as how it will all play out in the next few years. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alina. All right. So now we're going to turn to Brian Eiler. Brian is a senior fellow and director of the Southeast Asia program and the Energy, Water and Sustainability program at the uh, Stimson Center. And Brian, so far we have ASEAN as building, ASEAN as bus. I'm intrigued to hear what your metaphor for architecture is going to be. ASEAN as boat, Greg. Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, Greg, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here with this distinguished panel and, and, and following Edgar Kagan's uh, remarks. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks brief so we can get to the discussion. Um, but uh, as, as many of you tuning in uh, who watch the work of the Simpson Center and, and my team, we work on Mekong-related issues um, or mainland Southeast Asia-related issues within the energy, water, and sustainability space. So most of my comments will focus on this. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, there's a need for uh, the existing architecture. I, I think the architecture of um, of the region is 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 there. <laughs> it's strong, but it's there, uh, and um, that the existing architecture, uh, some of it, which has been described as a spaghetti bowl uh, or an alphabet soup of numerous uh, sub-regional frameworks and, and larger multilateral frameworks. Um, uh, we need to be looking at an unfolding environmental crisis and climate crisis in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and if we extend the climate issue then to maritime Southeast Asia, um, climate uh, broadly um, is threatening uh, this part of the world. Um, <clears throat> Edgar Kagan noted that uh, the Indo-Pacific, ASEAN in particular, is uh, the part of the world that is most threatened by climate change threats now and in the future. And we have to remember that uh, a good number of ASEAN countries are um, in the least developed country status or, or moving into middle income status and struggle to um, meet the challenge of climate change. Um, and so I think as far as the architecture is concerned, um, do we look at this as a, a challenge or an opportunity? Um, because when when we shift from, let's say, a strategy of mitigation, that is uh, emissions reduction, to one of adaptation and building resilience, then the value proposition for engaging on climate issues really changes uh, and, and, and shows that there's a large growth trajectory for private sector actors, um, as well as for deepened government engagement uh, and non-government engagement in the climate space. So pointing more closely to the Mekong, um, <clears throat> this is a, a river basin that is, um, you know, talking about two 
superlatives. Um, what makes the Mekong Mighty One is that it's the world's largest inland fishery. Uh, so the natural resource provisions of this river system that are done through natural ecosystem processes um, produce a, a 2.6 million ton fish catch for the people of mainland Southeast Asia. And much of that fish catch is exported to ASEAN. Um, so it's an ASEAN issue as well. This is, this is, uh, if those fisheries are affected, it's hitting ASEAN's tummies, it's hitting the rest of the world's uh, diet as well. And uh, at the same time, the Mekong Delta in Vietnam is one of the world's most robust agricultural baskets. Uh, I, I don't want to use the word bread basket because um, although bread is produced in Vietnam, um, it, it, this is a rice basket as well as a, an important export zone for uh, aquaculture products, uh, for high value fruit uh, and other food products that are again exported to the region um, uh, and consumed throughout the world. So uh, the, the vibrancy and the robustness of that agro, agricultural productivity of Vietnam's Mekong Delta um, relies again on the natural um, uh, flood pulse of the Mekong River, um, the, the, the kind of a stable climate uh, within the Mekong itself. And these two uh, uh, kind of superlatives of the Mekong or what make the Mekong mighty are, are threatened by both uh, climate threat and the threat of what man or what we are doing to uh, the river system by um, poorly planned dam, uh, damming processes as well as other uses of water. And just to highlight um, what the threat is, um, these last three years, 2021 included, um, fit within the top 10 driest years over a 110 year period of mainland Southeast Asia. That means the river's level has been lower um, uh, over the last three years than, than the previous uh, uh, 110 years uh, to the extent of 20 to 30 percent, which is kind of a hard uh, figure to swallow. Uh, but this climate crisis is playing out and upstream dams uh, are also regulating the river in a way that is reducing um, the flow when it needs to be robust. And that's during the wet season. And we won't get too deep into the details there. Um, so while mainland Southeast Asia seeks to recover from the coronavirus pandemic, um, it's also going through an environmental crisis of, of three years of ongoing drought. That fisheries catch that I mentioned is threatened. That agricultural uh, productivity of the Mekong Delta is also threatened. And, and whenever these uh, food systems and, and kind of income earning systems that come from the Mekong Delta break down, regional stability can also break down. So um, <clears throat> again, the architecture is there, whether it's through ASEAN, which hasn't robustly engaged on the Mekong issue set, but is seeking for ways to do so. And there are countries like Vietnam that are working to raise the Mekong issue set to a priority area within the ASEAN agenda, or it's within sub-regional um, <clears throat> architectural groups like the Mekong River Commission, the Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam trilateral um, uh, framework, Thailand's ACMEX framework. Um, the architecture is robust um, to engage, but engagement hasn't happened for a few reasons. And, and here, here comes some advice. Um, one is that I think uh, there's, a, there's an opportunity um, for ASEAN to engage the Mekong the green economy and a sustainable development space through the channel of climate. Um, ASEAN has been reluctant again to engage on the Mekong issue set, whether it's a kind of a criticism or, or a reluctancy to engage on the upstream dam, China's upstream dam issue, which China's upstream dams are extremely impactful for the, 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 the lower, the impacts on the lower Mekong um, or other reasons. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, Climate is a way in uh, because the issues that I mentioned, freshwater availability, sea level rise, defense uh, against sea level rise, food systems protection, green gray architecture are all ways to bring solutions to the, the Mekong. Um, secondly, uh, I think that development partners uh, who are involved in the Mekong space like the U.S. Um, should uh, pay more attention to the agency and the articulation that um, key states within mainland Southeast Asia um, are expressing right now, um, particularly Vietnam, Thailand, and Singapore, interestingly, that um, there are a lot of signals coming out of, of these countries that are, are guiding or uh, aspirational uh, for states like the US, Japan, 
Australia are okay um, to engage more deeply in the Mekong. So just to highlight one opportunity, um, I think what we're hearing from Vietnam is there's a need to build something that the U.S. has long tried to engage in this uh, sustainability space in, in the area that matters. So that would be kind of Laos and Cambodia, kind of the heart of the Mekong area. But if we watch at the numerous uh, projects that have um, tried to engage in this space and look at the actual deliverable streams, the deliverables often um, fall back into uh, deliverables that have outcomes in Thailand or Vietnam. So there's an attempt to get into that space and then you fall back because you have to produce something, uh, but we ultimately fail. I think uh, paying attention to Vietnam and Thailand uh, to lead us into this space, to lead development partners into this space can be a way forward. And again, Vietnam is saying, let's build something. Let's have a signature infrastructure project in Laos that hangs the US flag and the flags of like-minded development partners in Vietnam or Thailand together that can send a signal that America's uh, aspirations for sustainable infrastructure, whether it's through the Blue Dot Network or other modalities, um, uh, can shift from aspirational to actuality. And, and other benefits will accrue from building something. But some of those other attempts to kind of penetrate that, that sensitive, important space in Laos and Cambodia will then come, come to bear. Um, and then finally, I, I believe there's uh, within the architecture of um, of the commercial space and the economic space, uh, if we look at this uh, climate issue, again, as an area of tremendous economic opportunity, there are a large set of private actors in the United States that are working in the climate area on, say, rivers and coastal areas in the U.S., whether it's food systems, gray-green uh, infrastructure, coastal defense, et cetera, where best practices can be taken to the region if the regional states um, can articulate uh, policy messaging saying we're ready for this. And if, say, uh, U.S. foreign policy can help those private sector groups, again, this isn't our competitive advantage, but if there's a way to, um, to kind of guide them into a process where those that have climate forward solutions from the U.S. and development partners can deploy those solutions in these most threatened countries, Again, it's a wide area for economic growth um, and sustainability uh, within mainland Southeast Asia and the rest of ASEAN. I'll end my remarks there, but I hope we can get back to the, the climate and the sustainability talk during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. All right, folks, we have uh, 17 minutes by my clock, so let's get your questions in. Uh, I'm going to start while, while we wait for the queue to fill in, and I'm going to pick on Alina, if you don't mind. So. To, to, to throw in another metaphor here, you know, I and I think a lot of others who studied Southeast Asia and made that the focus of our careers, we were raised in the Church of Asian Centrality. We took our catechism. And, and as Abe said, for a lot of us, the last 10 years have seen our faith shaken. The ASEAN of the 1990s and the 2000s had a very ambitious strategic agenda. Right? First, the expansion of ASEAN, then the creation of the ARF and eventually the AS and ADM and Plus for regional centrality, uh, the ASEAN Charter on human rights and democracy promotion, and eventually the ASEAN community. What is ASEAN's strategic vision today? Does it have one anymore? So on paper, it does, right? If you look at all the statements, it's to, to be um, autonomous, to have agency, to maintain this independence of thought and action, and to have a robust foreign policy. All these great statements um, in all the official documents. In practice, of course, we all know that's been very challenging. And a lot of it has been blamed on this principle of non-interference, um, which I actually disagree with a little because I think over the years, we've seen this principle being um, tweaked with and, and played around with so that you have in the past made inroads uh, with Myanmar, for example. Obviously, that hasn't been sustainable over the long run. But non-interference is not this completely inviolable concept, and it's it's open to interpretation and reinterpretation. And so I think a lot of the bases of um, the, the, the foundation, if you will, of this ASEAN architecture still remains. And what it has 
boiled down to is kind of the political will of different individuals, different leaders within ASEAN. Many ASEAN leaders have been preoccupied not just over the course of the pandemic, but even prior to the pandemic with um, domestic agendas and domestic priorities. The ASEAN of the 90s, of, of its foundation years, you know, had a very different set of leaders that were very focused on, on the region. And unfortunately, that's been missing a little right now. And so that's why you have a little bit of this um, lack of a focus, if you will. Um, and hopefully with the right set of personalities, um, ASEAN will find its way back to, you know, it, its glory days if, if there ever were those. Thank you, Lena. Uh, Brian, I'm going to give you the first question from the queue uh, uh, from Nora at Columbia University, who said, thanks for a great discussion. What's the deal with ASEAN and its glaring lack of focus on the Mekong River? I, I think the same thing. I wake up the same <laughs> every day and I think the same question. Um, I, I know that there are certain uh, states within ASEAN that um, uh, would prefer to dominate the Mekong agenda, and therefore uh, prefer not to have it prioritized on the ASEAN agenda. Um, and at the same time, uh, if we just think about the maritime states looking at mainland Southeast Asia, um, I think there's a question of what's in it for us, right? Um, it's a prickly space, particularly if, if you try to engage the hydropower issue, um, which gets into geopolitics and um, sensitivities very quickly. And, and we know that ASEAN is not kind of attuned to, to such engagement. Um, but at the same time, if the, the ASEAN view can be attuned to uh, one how the crisis playing out in the Mekong um, affects uh, value chains uh, and export uh, uh, lanes for food in particular um, to maritime Southeast Asia and to the rest of the world. I mean, we're sitting here in the United States, a number of, uh, a huge number of our supermarkets carry products that are that are coming from the Mekong. So therefore, we're all consuming the water of the Mekong if it's an agricultural product, right? Um, if, if we can see it through this lens, that the crisis then affects our ability to consume, then that's a, that's everyone's issue, um, and particularly uh, maritime Southeast Asia's. And, and then finally, um, the, the Mekong is a, a deltaic river um, the, the, the floodplain of the Mekong encompasses nearly all of Cambodia and, and Vietnam's Mekong Delta. There are so many other floodplains and deltaic areas that are highly populated in main, main, uh, maritime Southeast Asia that face the common threat related to climate change and also poorly planned development around those coastal deltas uh, related to urbanization or water use or food planning. And so we're on the same boat on this. So here's that, that analogy. Um, and facing a similar issue set. So uh, this is why I think the climate lens is probably the best way in for ASEAN to address the, the Mekong issue. Thanks, Brian. Abe, I'm gonna go back to one of the questions I didn't get to under uh, uh, Edgar's keynote. And I think it, it matches well with, with your concern about kind of missing entities here. So uh, Piper Campbell, who many of us probably know, former ambassador to Mongolia and Charge to the ASEAN mission, US mission ASEAN, said, um, let's see, uh, many see AUKUS as a way to backdoor the UK into the Quad. There are other countries with arguably share interest with the Quad, e.g. the ROK. How will the US decide what issues get addressed in each forum and how do you de-conflict these uh, overlapping initiatives? And she says, PS, please get an ambassador to the US ASEAN mission. I think that was for Edgar, not you. Yeah, I, I thought those are great questions for Edgar. <laughs> and, uh, and great recommendations for Edward. Um, you know, as I, I th and I think, you know, Piper Campbell, I think is just a, has been a tremendous asset for the United States uh, as a diplomat for a long time and um, really uh, appreciate her uh, engagement in, on, on this uh, event. Um, I, I think that for the United States, the effort has been to, um, as I mentioned before, what we, um, what we can call uh, flexible multilateralism um, in that we assess which issue is going to be best addressed by uh, a given grouping of countries uh, based on their own interests, uh, sensitivities, etc. Um, the challenge when we start talking about bringing other countries in, be it the UK 
or the uh, ROK or uh, whomever else um, is that it starts to dilute um, and complicate the effectiveness of that organization, as we all know. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense to uh, find ways for other countries to coordinate with the Quad, be it the UK or uh, the ROK or whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about um, uh, Quad Plus, um, similar to ADMM Plus, um, and I think those sorts of mechanisms may work as a way to address specific issues um, or specific sets of issues that are particularly relevant to a broader grouping of countries. Um, but at the same time, I think the core group is special both because of their political systems, because of their geography, um, but also because of their shared interests and shared concerns about a wide variety of different issues. So um, unless we're able to make some significant progress with uh, countries like uh, the ROK, um, I'm, personally, I'm of the mind of, uh, to suggest keeping Quad as it is and letting it evolve and mature over time uh, into something that might be able to uh, address issues that are a bit less of the, the low-hanging fruit that we have. Thanks. Thanks, Abe. I'm sure we all agree that we should appoint an ambassador to the ASEAN mission, along with, I think, there's still four other remaining posts in Southeast Asia. Maybe it's five. Uh, all right, let's, let's go to uh, a question from Bart Edis, who's a non-resident senior associate here at CSIS. And this one's going to step on the toes of our, our next session next week a little bit. But he asks, any willing panelists, how do you think CPTPP members will treat the applications for membership uh, to CPTPP from the PRC and Taiwan? Will either or both become members before the UK? Uh, Abe, do you want to start us off on this? Do you have thoughts? Sure. I, I severely doubt that China will become a member before the UK. I actually doubt that the, the Chinese will become a member at all. Um, I expect that Japan will be quite opposed to this, um, really regardless of whatever um, promises or, or, or uh, pressure is made by Beijing on this. Uh, to me, the question is what other countries uh, will do as well. Um, will, how will Australia respond to these? Um, if and when the UK joins, how they'll respond. I think it's a goes beyond questions of uh, economics and the, the technical pieces of uh, exemptions. I think it goes into the realm of strategy that um, the exemptions that would be required to bring the Chinese in would fundamentally change uh, what makes CPTPP important and special um, and really degrade the quality of that agreement. Um, but also, I think there's tremendous geopolitical interest we have um, in keeping the CPTPP um, what it is. Um, you know, if it were up to me, the U.S. would have been part of TPP, let alone CPTPP. Um, I do expect that at some point, the United States will find a way to join um, in some way, um, in some formulation. Um, but I think it's going to be a long time coming. Um, so until that time comes, I think it's going to be uh, on countries like Japan, like Australia, like the UK, to keep uh, the CPTPP high quality uh, based on uh, the values and principles of liberal economics uh, and, and uh, political liberalism and um, doing what they can to um, keep the Chinese out. Um, and I think the United States has a role to help them. Um, in terms of Taiwan, um, I think it may be difficult politically for countries to support Taiwan's specific membership into um, or explicit membership into the CPP, CPTPP. But I do think that there would be a way for them to uh, build uh, mechanisms for them to be, uh, to be able to participate in that organization in a more of a de facto, unofficial way um, that's consistent with their uh, political status. Um, realizing that there's uh, complexities there um, as it relates to APEC and Taiwan's participation there. I think that's just the political realities. And there, I think the United States does have a broader role to play in terms of taking some of the first steps to um, uh, diversify Taiwan's economic relationships um, and really um, lighting a path that other members of the CPTPP could then follow. I'll stop there. Thanks, Abe. Uh, Alina, let me turn to you for what might be our last question, since we only have five minutes left. This one again comes from Karen Lee, uh, who says, 
Does ASEAN feel increased pressure this year to act on key issues such as the South China Sea, considering that Cambodia takes over next year? And I, I, I guess there's a bigger question here, right? Does ASEAN pay attention to who's coming up next and have to get things done in the, you know, productive years? Yeah, unfortunately, nobody will let uh, 2012, when Cambodia last had a chairmanship, live down. Um, so it, the ASEAN and Cambodia will forever be reminded of what happened then. And I think, if anything, Cambodia feels the pressure of its chairmanship. But certainly, uh, Southeast Asian countries, other ASEAN member states, um, do, I think, feel a certain amount of pressure, particularly with the recent developments uh, that you're so well aware of, Greg, in the South China Sea with um, China's increasingly bellicose moves in the South China Sea. Um, added to that, of course, you have all the other pressures that I mentioned uh, post-pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, um, and economic uh, pressures as well that are all coming to bear on what will uh, be another challenging year for the ASEAN chair. Um, so in short, yes, there will be pressures. All right, thank you very much. And that's it for the queue, which almost never happens. But I want to turn to Brian because we have just a, a few minutes left. Brian, any last thoughts on the Mekong, things that people should be aware of ahead of the summits? Thanks, Greg. Um, I, I think there's one uh, US-led opportunity that is missing from the architecture. Um, currently, the U.S. has uh, the existing Mekong U.S. partnership, which is an amplification or expansion of the previous Lower Mekong initiative. Um, a really solid effort that is wide ranging uh, in, in breadth, uh, ranging from engagement on non-traditional security issues, water governance, energy, um, health, uh, uh, education, and uh, is now um, designed in a very flexible way to better meet needs as they're articulated by local stakeholders in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, however, there's one thing that's missing from the Mekong U.S. partnership, and it, it uh, dovetails nicely with um, what we're talking about today. There's no summit. Uh, there's no high-level leader summit for the Mekong U.S. partnership. Japan U.S. Mekong partnership, I'm sorry, Japan Mekong partnership has a high-level leader summit. Australia uh, will have one. Korea has one. Um, all of the development partners that are engaging uh, meaningfully in the Mekong have one, the U.S. does not. There was an attempt under the previous administration in Las Vegas, right when the coronavirus was um, uh, kind of setting in, um, to have a first summit, but that was uh, uh, canceled and postponed. And maybe it would have happened a little bit too prematurely. But now the time is right for one. Um, there are political obstacles. Uh, Myanmar, obviously, is, is the, the one kind of elephant in the room that could prevent a summit from happening, uh, but it's not impossible. So I, I, I do um, hope that sooner or later we see a leader summit for the Mekong U.S. partnership. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much, Brian. All right, that is it for our first session. I want to remind everybody who tuned in or who's going to watch the video over the next few days that we have session two uh, exactly one week from now on the 27th running from 9 to 11 a.m. here in D.C., and that's going to focus on the APEC Summit, which will take place in November. Uh, it'll be run by my colleagues Bill Reinch and, and Matt Goodman in the Shoal Chair and the Econ Program here at CSIS. Uh, for us here at the Southeast Asia team and AMTI, I want to thank Abe and Brian and Lena, and especially Edgar Kagan for taking the time out, and all of you for joining us. Uh, stay safe, and we'll see you for the next event.